Welcome to another study of God's word. I'm so grateful to the Lord for all of you who have joined with me on this evening to uh, look into the rich uh, truth that is found in um, the word of God. Thank the Lord for all of you, um, those of you who share uh, every Wednesday when you come together with me and um, open up the word of God and we spend uh, these moments looking into God's um, truth. Thank the Lord for, uh, for each one of you. I want to also once again thank God for our media ministry members, those persons that labor um, so faithfully and diligently to make sure that these opportunities are, are given to us. And um, I thank God for each and every one of you uh, for your, um, your labor of love and your patience in faith waiting for our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise God for all of you. Um, the Lord has been good. I think that uh, that would be considered an understatement for most of us. God has been good. He has been uh, more uh, than good um, in allowing us to live our lives and um, do so in the midst of all of this that's going on around us. And he has proven himself to be a wise God and also proven himself to be a keeping God. And so I'm hoping that you uh, are appreciating the very fact that you are here today because God is a keeper uh, and he's faithful. God is faithful. So we want to be mindful of that as we move uh, through this uh, last month of the year, approaching the celebration of our Lord's birth. And um, I'm hoping that you will remember that um, as he has been given to us as a gift, that we will be mindful um, of the fact that we owe him everything. Amen. We owe him everything. Now, a uh, couple of things real quick before we jump into our study for this evening. Shiloh, I want to um, first thank you for uh, your cooperation um, and your that spirit of cooperation that you have as we have been um, um, praying on Saturday mornings. Uh, you have been absolutely fantastic in your response to my request on last Sunday. Um, and uh, um, well, the Sunday before last, when I asked that we would be careful and mindful of the time uh, during our Saturday morning gatherings. Um, and you responded absolutely wonderfully um, on Saturday, this past Saturday, you were great. And we need to keep that up. We want to um, not so much curtail the, uh, the prayer time as much as afford everyone an opportunity to uh, be a part of it um, and, you know, not feel like they, you know, some people actually participate in the prayer time, others don't, they just want to be on the line so that they can hear the prayers. Um, and we don't want to, uh, you know, have a whole two hour situation going on on Saturday mornings. That's not a good thing. Um, if you want to pray two hours at home, do what you got to do, that's fine. But uh, when we have corporate prayer, prayer gathering, we want to be mindful that there are other people um, who want to participate or others who are participating. Um, and, uh, you know, we want to be just remind or remember uh, those other people as well. Okay. So thank you so much for your, um, 
your kindness. I, um, I'm careful about how I phrase and structure that because I know that some of you, um, you know, may be concerned about, you know, maybe I'm trying to cut off the prayer time. That's not what I'm doing. Not at all. Um, but that moment on Saturday is very important for our church family, the whole body. Um, you're welcome to pull two or three people, you know, together during the week or by yourself um, and, you know, pray as long as you like. But when we start talking about 20, 30 people on a line, um, you want to be, be, be mindful of the fact that they're there um, and be mindful of the fact that they made sacrifices to be there. And you want to be mindful of the fact that you don't want to hold them so that they lose that the morning and other activities, other responsibilities, et cetera. So keep those things in mind. God bless you and thank you. Uh, also, I want to ask you, Shiloh, uh, to remember uh, that um, we are, you know, carefully trying to reclaim our space in the sanctuary uh, in terms of, you know, returning to the sanctuary, pardon me. And the first thing is that, uh, you know, things are not gonna look the way they did before the pandemic, okay? Um, some of that is intentional, um, but a lot of it has to do very simply with learning to adjust to a, what might be identified as a new norm, okay? So um, I'm asking you to be patient with us as we're trying to uh, get things together to see how things are gonna flow. Um, chances are we will never go back to what it was. Um, some of it we need to reinstate, but some of it we don't, we don't need it. So I want to encourage you um, to continue to be patient with us as we're trying to feel our way and in the process, do what we can to make sure things get done the right way. I also want to encourage you, Shiloh, to continue to give. Um, we've noticed that there has been a falling off uh, with the giving um, over the last few months. And quite frankly, it doesn't look good uh, um, in terms of what we have to do and what our responsibilities are. Um, we need your help, your continued support, your continued giving. We need you to do that, all right? So please, I wanna ask you to be mindful to do that. And we want you to do it uh, to the glory of God. Bless um, as, um, uh, bless us, bless the church um, as often as you can. Um, give according to that which is uh, going to be um, acceptable and, it, you know what I'm saying? Do what you've been, what you've done, uh, but maybe have, um, you, you haven't done recently, okay? So let's be a blessing to the church, a uh, blessing to the ministry and uh, the work of the Lord here at, um, at, at Shiloh, all right? All right, so um, we want to come along now and uh, consider uh, this word that uh, the Lord has given us. Um, and I'm going to ask that you would be prayerful for me as we uh, attempt to obey God and um, do his work. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence and your power. We pray your blessing now um, upon your word. Uh, speak life to us and we will glorify you forever in Jesus' name. Amen.
So uh, we um, have been looking at um, the study of the doctrine of God, and uh, we um, have been the last two, uh, week or so been considering that God is invisible. God is invisible. And what we've done is looked at it this way. Um, content, talked about this last week, what the Bible says about the invisibility of God. And we saw there that there are a number of verses and passages uh, that give us um, information on uh, God's invisibility. Uh, then there's the consideration, and that is there were testimonies that uh, were found in the record of scripture um, that people saw God. And what, uh, what we found out was that from the human side of the equation, it was as if they saw God, but from the God side of the equation, uh, they did not really see God they saw something, but they did not really see God. Um, as we said on last week, Exodus 33 tells us that no man can see God and live. So, um, and of course, the record of John, both his gospel and his uh, first epistle, uh, declares that um, no man has seen God at any time. All right. So um, uh, they saw something but they did not really see God, all right? All right, and then thirdly, uh, conclusion. That's where we left off last week, um, and we began to talk about um, this idea that the invisible God actually wants to be known. This invisible God wants to be, wants to be known. The invisible God wants to be known, all right? And of course, we were talking about that as we were concluding our time um, last time. And so we want to return uh, to that discussion on, on this evening and uh, spend some time talking about the fact that the invisible God wants to be, he wants to be known, all right? So let's um, let's look at it. Let's 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 talk about let's talk about this truth that the invisible God um, wants to be he wants to be known. All right. How then? Um, how then does he want to be known? How does he want to be want to be known? Um, well, we said that the invisible God has chosen uh, to be known um, three ways, all right? And he wants to be known at least three ways, all right? First, he wants to be known through his creation. Let's consider Romans chapter one, the book of Romans chapter one. Um, after he does his opening um, and greeting to the church uh, at Rome and in, the, in Paul's letter to, uh, to Rome, to the church at, there at Rome, um, and the first 15 verses, he lays out some truth about who he is, who they are as a result of their life with God. Um, the apostle Paul then um, presents to them this very important uh, truth. And that is that God um, is using the gospel to present Jesus Christ to the world uh, for the purpose of helping them understand that um, God's righteousness uh, the righteous standard that he requires is found in Jesus, right? And so that gospel, that gospel message 
that the apostles proclaim is in fact uh, the, the message that lays out for us this very important truth that Christ is God's um, answer to man's problem um, because in Christ, God's standard is fulfilled. In Christ, God's standard, what God requires is fulfilled, okay? All right, after he does that, okay, presenting that truth, verse 18, and I'm jumping back a few verses because it kind of helps us understand the message of verse 20, all right? He says in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They don't believe the truth and they won't accept it or receive it, right? So he says, God's wrath is revealed. The question then becomes why, why? Verse 19, listen very carefully. He says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God has showed it unto them, right? So keep that in mind. Verse 19, the reason why God's wrath is revealed is because men are without excuse. Why? Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Watch this. For God has showed it to them both in them and to them. Then in verse 20, to stick with me for a minute, and we're going to go into this. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, watch now, are clearly seen. See it? Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are, here it is again, without excuse, okay? So the idea is that God um, literally puts men in a position where we have absolutely no excuse, zero, not one. Um, and we don't have a single excuse because the invisible God has shown us himself, watch now, by what he has created. Verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. All right. So our eyes behold the wonder of this invisible God by what he has made. Right. Um, verse 19 would argue that those things are confirmed um, by an internal witness, because he showed it, watch this, he says in verse 19, he's manifested in them. Things that may be known of God is manifest in them. So there is the internal witness, and then there's the external witness. And that those things together are, are enough um, to get man's questions answered if they really wanted them, if they really wanted answers to their questions about God, those questions would be answered and could be answered, but men refuse and reject because we really don't want to know the invisible God. Not really. We don't want to know him. We want to benefit from everything he's made. We want to enjoy 
uh, what he has created. And we want to do all of that without ever acknowledging or recognizing him, right? But the truth is, is that both the internal witness and the external witness leave us without an excuse. We don't have one. I hate to be the bearers of that news, but it is the truth. Um, God is going to judge the world fairly and justly. Um, and it is due to the fact that he's already done exactly what he's needed to do to bring us to himself. But men reject the knowledge of God. Men refuse to obey and follow. That's mm -hmm. on us. And we will pay. Uh, we will pay for our unwillingness to follow and to do what um, God has said, all right? So first, God makes himself known by his creation. But then, how do we know him? Because the invisible God also makes himself known through his Christ. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Um, now, understand this. Uh, please be careful in dealing with this, this idea of Jesus being the firstborn of every creature. It does not mean that he is um, created. That's not what that means. Um, please don't, don't get hung up on that and get thrown off. It does not mean that he is created. Um, please stick a pin in that because we're going to be dealing with that more extensively in the weeks to come. We're going to have some exciting things to say about that phrase, the firstborn of every creature. Please don't, don't, don't go to sleep on that. All right. Um, but for our purposes tonight and what we're dealing with this evening, um, notice this. The text says, who is the image of the invisible God? The idea is, is that in Jesus, we see God. We see the invisible God in the visible person of Jesus Christ. That's the primary issue tonight. And I don't want you to miss that. A um, couple of things, the same book uh, declares for us, he says in Colossians chapter three, he says, um, he is the fullness. He is uh, chapter two, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter two, he says, he is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, meaning that he is all of God in a human body. That's the idea. Um, on one occasion in the upper room, he's with the disciples, and one of them says to him, he says, uh, Lord, show us the Father, and we'll be satisfied. All you got to do all you got to do, Jesus, is just go on and show us, show us the Father, and we will be content. We'll be okay if you just show him, show him to us. And Jesus responded and said to him, he says, if you've seen me, watch now, you've seen the Father. In other words, what more representation, what more image, what what more pictures do you need to be able to identify God other than the ones that I've already given you? My presence with you is evidence that the invisible God, or rather I should say of what the invisible God is like. What you've seen in me, what you've heard 
from me is evidence. Beloved is what he's saying. And that is, I am the embodiment of the invisible God. You don't need to look anywhere else. You don't need to go anywhere else. All you have to do is look at me and listen to me. And you will find out exactly what that invisible God is like. And again, I hasten to tell you that whether it be creation or Christ, the invisible God has given us both for the express purpose, pardon me, of wanting to be known. He wants us to know him. He wants us to embrace him. He wants us um, to have a relationship with him. And um, that, of course, benefits us in ways that we can't really imagine on this side. We won't fully grasp it until we get to heaven. But before we get there, we can at least understand this. The only way we know him now is because he wants us to know him. He has to initiate that relationship because without his initiation, we'd all be lost because none of us would ever come to him on our own. But look at him in his passion and his plea. The invisible God, he could have stayed that way and been fine. He could have just remained invisible, remained silent, remained quiet, not said a word, and we would have all died and been separated from him for all eternity. But he does this work because he wants us to know him. He wants us far more than we want him. All right. How do we know that he wants to be known? How do we know him? Here it is. We know him through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God wants us to know him And he wants us to understand that that knowledge is a privilege. It is a privilege that we're given, it is a privilege that he offers to all of us. And um, we come to that place by faith. So we have the witness of creation, we have the witness of Christ, but then it is our faith that activates um, the grace that saves us. And um, we uh, need to know, again, that it's not of works. Um, we don't earn it. Um, it's not uh, something that we can get a hold of, you know, on our own. 
but um, it is by his grace. His grace is available and we experience that grace through an act of faith. Um, we lay hold of truth and um, God blesses, God blesses. Um, without faith, it is impossible to please him for he that comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Through faith, we lay hold of the invisible. Through faith, we lay hold of the invisible. Um, Second Corinthians uh, helps us with this uh, because there the apostle Paul says to us uh, that we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't live our lives um, in the context of what we see only. But we live our lives in the context of what we can't see primarily. And we live that way by faith. And beloved, that's the only way that um, we're going to experience God for real. It's the only way to have that full um that full experience of of knowing god and um having a life with him okay um there is another verse there is a a verse i want to share with you i want to show you um and it's going to be helpful um, in the in what might be identified as the practical application of this of this truth, and it's in the book of Hebrews, um, and it's about a fellow named Moses, and it's verse twenty seven says, by faith he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king watch for he endured as seeing him who is invisible that's the operation of faith that's how faith operates faith operates as seeing him who is invisible that's what faith is um, it is the act of living life um, as if you are seeing the one who is invisible. That's faith, all right? And that applies to every single aspect of our lives, um, whether it be um, a brand new Christian, um, or, or whether it be a babe, of course, a babe, um, whether you are growing in your faith as young men, according to 1 John chapter 2, and then, or you're a father, and that is an elder, mature Christian. The idea is whether you are moving from immaturity to maturity, whatever the situation is, wherever you are on that, on that, um, on that growth plain, understand that we know God by faith, and faith causes us to see him who is invisible, right? But again, God wants to be known, and you will find that he will appear, he will show up, he will come along um, to those who seek him. You will, you will be given the 
uh, the proof, if you will, um, that the invisible God is there. He will let you know that he's there. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for your word tonight, for the truth that's found in your word. And we pray your blessing um, that you give us what we stand in need of. Uh, and God, we will glorify you and praise you forever for you alone are worthy. Be exalted now in Jesus' name. Amen. Saints, I love you. I miss you. We're trusting the Lord uh, that we will be together soon. You are invited, of course, to uh, our gathering on Sundays at 10 a.m. Uh, we were back in the building. Um, and then on Saturday mornings for our 7 a.m. prayer gathering, everyone is invited to join us on, um, um, online. Uh, we are going, we're having a great time there and the Lord's doing some wonderful things in our midst. All right. I love you. I miss you. We believe in God for your well-being. Please stay safe. Follow uh, the rules and the guidelines um, and uh, let the Lord do his work in and through your life. God bless you. Until next time. The Lord bless.